how one impossible radar trick let British pilots hunt the Luftwaffe at night. In the early 1940s, the night skies over Britain were not peaceful. They were haunted, filled with the steady hum of engines and the deep rhythmic pulse of German bombers crossing the channel under cover of darkness. The Luftwaffe's night raids had become a constant torment. While daytime air battles could be met with spitfires and hurricanes racing across the blue, the nights belonged to the enemy. The bombers came in waves, unseen until the sudden orange bloom of explosions flickered across the black horizon. Entire cities were reduced to smoldering scars. The Royal Air Force was desperate, not for bravery, it had that in abundance, but for vision. To fight an enemy in the dark, one first had to see. For most of the war's early years, the British night skies were a place of helplessness. Searchlights crisscrossed the heavens like frantic fingers, trying to grasp something that slipped endlessly through their beams. Anti-aircraft batteries thundered blindly. Pilots took off into the abyss, hoping for luck more than strategy. The Luftwaffe's night campaign, the Blitz, was designed to break the British will. And for a time, it seemed to be working. The Royal Air Force could only respond sporadically, shooting down a fraction of the bombers that devastated London, Coventry, and countless smaller towns. It wasn't courage that was lacking. It was technology. Yet in the shadowed laboratories and radar stations along the British coast, something extraordinary was taking shape. The first whispers of a new kind of warfare, invisible, mathematical, precise, began to circulate among the scientists of the telecommunications research establishment. The British had already shocked the world with their chain-home radar system, the vast network of early warning stations that helped them win the Battle of Britain. But radar, in its original form, was blind to detail. It could see that aircraft were coming but could not tell a fighter pilot where to look once he was airborne in the dark. The radar stations were too large, too slow, too earthbound. What was needed was a miracle, a radar system that could fly. The idea was deemed impossible. The technology was bulky and unstable, consuming massive amounts of power. Mounting it on a plane seemed beyond the reach of wartime engineering. But Britain had no choice but to attempt the impossible. In early 1941, a group of engineers led by Robert Watson Watt and backed by the Air Ministry began a series of secret trials in Malvern and Christchurch. Their goal was simple, but audacious. To create an airborne radar small enough to fit inside a night fighter. A machine that could find an enemy bomber in total darkness and guide the pilot to within striking distance. The first experimental system, codenamed AI Mark IV, airborne interception, was crude and temperamental. The radar operator, sitting behind the pilot in a cramped cockpit, stared at a flickering cathode screen while listening to static hum through his headset. The aircraft itself, usually a twin-engine Bristol Bowfighter, vibrated with the effort of flight, its propellers cutting through icy air at 15,000 feet. The operator could barely make out the faint green traces that signaled a target often lost amid waves of interference. Yet those faint lines represented the future. They were the first echoes of a technology that would change the course of the war. To make the system work required not only innovation, but a radical rethinking of how to fight. Ground radar stations would now act as silent shepherds, guiding night fighters toward the approximate location of enemy bombers. Once within range, the onboard radar, the impossible trick, would take over, homing in on the target invisible to human eyes. This was the beginning of the intruder night war, a deadly cat and mouse game fought in darkness. At first, results were disheartening. The radar image was unstable, its range limited to just a few miles. But each sortie taught something new. Engineers tweaked the frequencies, adjusted antenna lengths, refined the cathode screens. Every pilot who returned brought back not just survival but data. And then, one night in late 1941, it worked. Over the English countryside, a bowfighter intercepted a Heinkel He-111 bomber entirely through radar guidance. The bomber was invisible against the black sky, its engines muffled by altitude. Yet the radar operator calmly directed the pilot until the dark silhouette filled the gun sight. The burst of machine gun fire that followed marked not just a kill, but a revolution. The success electrified the Royal Air Force. Word spread through the squadrons of a new kind of weapon, one that did not rely on sight or chance but on invisible waves and mathematics. Night fighters were now hunters, not prey. New aircraft were designed specifically for the task. The de Havilland Mosquito, sleek and silent, 
became the ultimate predator of the night. With improved radar models like AI Mark VIII, capable of detecting targets up to five miles away, British pilots began to turn the tables on the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe's advantage crumbled faster than anyone expected. Their pilots had grown accustomed to flying unchallenged at night, lulled into complacency by months of near immunity. When the first bombers began to vanish without warning, confusion spread. Crews reported being attacked by ghost planes emerging from the dark. Some believed the British had developed supernatural abilities. In truth, the new radar systems had made the unseen visible. The hunters had become the hunted. The statistics began to shift dramatically. By mid-1942, night fighter squadrons equipped with airborne radar were accounting for a growing percentage of enemy losses. The ratio of kills to sorties soared. Cities that once burned nightly under German bombs now had defenders capable of striking back. The morale of British civilians, battered by years of darkness and destruction, began to lift. For the first time since the Blitz began, the night skies seemed to favor the defenders. Behind this triumph, however, lay an equally remarkable story of collaboration. Scientists, engineers, and pilots worked side by side, often in secrecy, often with little sleep, bound by the urgency of survival. Laboratories turned into barracks, workshops into command centers. The pace of innovation was relentless. Each improvement, smaller components, faster frequency tuning, better display resolution, meant more lives saved. Radar operators, once considered secondary crew members, became vital to mission success, their calm voices guiding pilots through chaos. The partnership between man and machine had reached a new frontier. By 1943, radar had evolved beyond anyone's early expectations. The once cumbersome equipment now fit neatly within the nose of aircraft, shielded from weather and vibration. Some units experimented with microwave radar, using cavity magnetrons, a British invention that would later transform not just warfare, but civilian technology worldwide. The precision was astonishing. A pilot could now detect an enemy aircraft several miles ahead, track its course, close in silently, and attack before being seen. The dark had become an ally, the night a domain of control rather than fear. The Luftwaffe tried to respond. They introduced their own radar systems, changed flight routes, and deployed radar jammers. They even equipped night fighters to escort bombers on raids. But British ingenuity countered every move. The development of window, strips of aluminum foil dropped from aircraft to confuse enemy radar, further tilted the balance. In combination with the airborne interception systems, Britain had not only defended its skies but mastered the art of electronic warfare. By late 1944, the night war was all but won. The Luftwaffe's bomber fleets were shattered, their morale broken. Many missions never reached their targets. Others were forced to turn back or crash in confusion. RAF night fighters, guided by their radar, now operated deep into occupied Europe, intercepting aircraft before they could even cross the channel. The psychological effect was immense. The British people, once huddled in shelters praying for dawn, could now look up at the night sky with pride rather than fear. The impossible radar trick had given them back their nights and their confidence. When victory finally came in 1945, it was celebrated not just on the ground, but in the air. Those who had flown through the darkness knew how close the war had come to a very different outcome. The story of Britain's airborne radar was not only one of machines and frequencies, but of imagination and resolve. It was the story of how a small island nation, under relentless attack, refused to surrender to despair, and instead turned the very forces of physics into a shield. In the aftermath of the war, Historians often credited the Spitfire, the Lancaster, and the Codebreakers of Bletchley Park with Britain's survival. Yet those who understood the night war knew that radar, particularly the airborne kind, had been the silent hero. Without it, the Luftwaffe might have maintained its grip on the darkness. With it, Britain learned to see in ways the enemy never imagined possible. The legacy of that discovery extended far beyond the war. The technology developed for night interception became the foundation for post-war aviation, civilian air traffic control, and even the microwave oven that would later sit in millions of homes. What began as an act of desperation ended as a triumph of human creativity. Standing today at old airfields like Tangmere or Duxford, one can still imagine the scene. The black silhouettes of twin-engine fighters taxiing down fog-shrouded runways, 
their crews climbing aboard with calm determination, the faint glow of radar screens illuminating their faces. They were not merely flying machines into battle, they were carrying the future. Every green pulse on the radar scope was a heartbeat of invention, a signal that humanity could conquer fear through understanding. The impossible radar trick was never truly about trickery at all. It was about faith, in science, in teamwork, in the idea that light could be found even in the deepest dark. As the war dragged on, that belief became a kind of moral compass for the RAF and the entire nation. Britain had learned that courage alone could win battles, but it was knowledge that won wars. And so, when the final chapter of the air war was written, the heroes of the night stood quietly among the ranks of history's great innovators. The pilots, the radar operators, the engineers, and the dreamers who made the invisible visible had changed not only the outcome of a conflict, but the nature of human perception itself. The night, once a realm of terror, had been transformed into a theater of triumph. And in the stillness above the sleeping fields of Britain, the echoes of that victory remain, faint, steady, and eternal, like the pulse of a radar beam searching the endless sky.